Hey, I'm Emma Terrell and I am the Urban Botanist here today in beautiful Ancaster, Ontario, where I'm going to be introducing you to our expert entomologist and bug fanatic, Marvin Gunderman. Oh, look at it, we got a grub. That's Ooh. gonna be a beetle larva, look at. That is a classic. Look at this, this is beauty into itself. Oh, look at that chunky boy. And look at, we have a millipede here. Yeah, lots of ice, isopods rule. Oh, that's a beauty, eh? Some of these are great. These are show isopods. They're kind of cute. Oh, they are. This guy's really cute. Hey, I'm Emma, and I'm the urban botanist. I'm researching and discovering ways to live wilder. Through this series, you will be introduced to our experts who will be teaching you how to live, breathe, walk, smell, and taste wilder. We're going to teach you how easily accessible nature is and how you at home can engage yourselves. This is a cool piece here because you can see a lot of damage from a carpenter ant colony at one point. My name is Marvin Gunderman. I'm a retired professor of entomology at McMaster University. I was there for 28 years, 28 glorious years, by the way. And so I've met you know, just hundreds of amazing students. And if one of them is here today. So Marvin and I actually go way back, in fact, I actually credit a lot of my passion for the natural world to him. He was my professor in university. We actually met on a field course. We were living in cabins. We were out every day with our big nets, swooping in the fields, collecting and cataloging variety of species of insects in Ontario. Marvin's passion for insects absolutely captivated me and really inspired me to grow a deeper understanding and connection with insects as well. And this is where my natural history passion is in, on full display. So I've got pinned insects, right, mostly beetles, and in a synoptic insect collection there, so the, of the or, other orders. How old are some of these collections that you have? Oh, I, like I started formally in 1975. So my oldest insects will be in that, that area. But like most people that are nature nuts at this point in our life, it started young. I've always found small creatures fascinating. We don't know much about them and they're often ignored. And worse, we have fears about them which are often irrational and unfounded. So as an entomologist, part of I find my calling is to dispel those fears. I want people to understand how important insects are and that 99% of them are absolutely necessary and beneficial. We should focus on insects being the amazing creatures and vital creatures that they are on this planet. There's so many insects that are tiny and we miss them. The ones we have identified are all the big ones that you can easily see and easily collect. Well, let's face it, right now we have approximately a million described species. And estimates from the rainforest, you know, where they do fogging of trees and then they collect all the insects that land on sheets below, so many of them have never been seen before that estimates are up to 30 million insect species are on this planet. We've identified one million of that 30. 29 million more to go. There's only two major habitats that you cannot find insects on this planet, and that's the polar ice caps in the open ocean. Every habitat you can think of, from lava tubes and, and thermal springs, deserts, you name the major habitats, there's a plethora of, of insects, or pleth plethora, depending on how you like to pronounce that. It's amazing, amazing how they are just integrated to every single habitat on this planet. That's why they're so important. If you lose insects, you lose a building block, a foundation of that local community ecosystem, and things start disappearing quickly. This one acre plot of cotton in Northeast Mexico is all the reason of one and a half million acres of cotton that grew here 10 years ago. The disaster here in Mexico has stood for 10 years as a warning to U.S. agriculture that its overuse of insecticides is also in danger of creating an insect backlash. The warning has been largely ignored. 
the chemical bombardment continues. When insects start disappearing, you lose pollination, number one. The other is decomposition. You can imagine if we didn't have that help with decomposition, now we'd have more disease. And of course, insects are also predators on other insects. So if you've got a pest species, predator insects keep them in check. So you can see how it's all integrated so tightly that if you lose key species or worse habitats, you're going to have a bad state down the road. So not only are they everywhere, they're vital. So Marv makes a really compelling case for why insects are so important and vital to our everyday life. So today we're at the Canadian Museum of Nature, joined by expert entomologist Dave Chung, where we will be talking a little bit more in detail about what makes an insect an insect. Well, an uh, insect is an arthropod, so an animal with an exoskeleton and jointed legs. But what makes an insect an insect and different from other arthropods are the fact that they have three main body segments, the head, thorax, and abdomen. And a lot of people don't know, but most insects have wings. A true insect has six legs, three body segments. So let's talk a little bit more about what makes an insect an insect. Why is the life cycle or the stages that an insect lives through so interesting and specific to insects alone? Well, insects have three major kinds of life cycles or types of metamorphosis. So metamorphosis means, you know, to change. And the first group is the ametabolous insects, meaning uh, there's no metamorphosis. The juvenile insects look exactly like the adults and they simply grow bigger and bigger as they molt. What would be an example of that? Like a silverfish. Then we're gonna move on to the hemimetabolous insects. Think of a, a grasshopper. Think about what a baby grasshopper looks like. It looks like the adult grasshopper, but it doesn't have one feature. What do you think that is? I don't know. Wings! Exactly! Oh, this is, so this is a good way to tell the age of an insect. I've actually had that question myself. Oh. I had some praying mantises in my backyard. Those of you who follow me will know this already. So I thought I had them not only secured in my greenhouse. Oh my God, they're f***ing everywhere. Oh, there's hundreds. They were supposed to stay in here. Everyone who is asking questions on why the f do I have <laughs> not one, but two <laughs> praying mantis egg sacs. They're cool. Hello. Hello. Both of them were huge, but one had wings and the other one didn't. So that was kind of, and I sent that picture to you. And basically we determined that one was a little bit older than the other right. one. So the definition of wings can help you to determine the age yes. sort of of an insect. Exactly. Okay, so cool. So metabolic insects get their wings at the very last molt. And then they're sexually mature. Well, you have your wings and you're sexually mature. What's the next step is like you- You're gonna fly around and find someone to mate with. Exactly. Oh, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then that brings us to the last type of uh, metamorphosis, the complete metamorphosis or metabolous insects, which happens to make up about 80% of all insects. And these are the ones that change. So they have a larva stage, mm -hmm. which looks very different than the adult stage. Like so, a caterpillar exactly. to a butterfly. Exactly. So different, right? Absolutely. Uh, Crazy. It, Crazy it, it different. It still blows my mind. Yeah. It is incredible. Right. The caterpillar stage is really the stage where they're just feeding. They're designed to process food and store a ton of energy and then it gets bigger and bigger with each molt. And then finally, when you have a mature larva, uh, it molts and um, becomes a pupal stage. So this stage, traditionally, they don't move as much, they're more dormant. But what's happening inside is the <laughs> insect is actually melting down and reassembling its body to the adult stage. And the adult stage usually has wings. It's very unworldly, isn't it? Really? They're like little aliens. Yeah. To, to, to just conceptualize something like that is, is cr it's, it's mind blowing. Crazy. Imagine us melting down to a puddle in a little tiny coop. Not only do they, they look different, they usually eat a different type of food and they live in a completely different habitat. 
The scientists think that this is the reason why insects are so successful is because the adults and the young are not competing for the same niche, for the same food or for the same habitat. And probably contributes a lot to the diversification exactly. of insects as well. Exactly. You got it. Wow. So Marv, I know that there are so many different types of ecosystems where one can discover insects in your backyard, in your urban environment. So let's kind of talk about what some of those ecosystems look like. Sure, and here you can't get any simpler than someone's backyard. And the first thing you want to look at are flowers. Insects and flowering plants have co-evolved for about 130 million years. It's all about getting a nectar fix for the insects and to get that pollen from point A to point B for the plants, right? So mm -hmm. it's a very intimate relationship. And so I always zero in on flowers because flowers have nectar reserves and pollen, right? The nectar is the energy and the pollen is the protein source for bees. And also if you're looking to attract insects to your backyard or if you're looking to provide, you know, a safe space for insects to visit, Planting flowers, Absolutely. especially native species, is yes. a great thing to do. Yes. Plants have evolved in a way to fully attract insects, but everything from the color to the way that, you know, physiologically they're yeah. grown, it's so, it's so fascinating. And some plants actually have kind of what looks like landing strips, right? right? Yes. And then if you shine a UV light on them, they actually glow because a lot of insects uh, navigate by UV light. When you look at the design of insects and you look at lightweightness, take a good look. I mean, insects are just simply a series of tubes. It's a tubular body. All the legs are tubes, right? They're all hollow. And in an engineering perspective, a tube is way stronger than a rod. So with less mass, you have a stronger structure. So this is one example that insects are by design, efficient, they're light and strong. And we have adapted that now for lightweight, strong structures in engineering. And the list goes on and on. When you look at insects' uh, sensory systems, you look at insect vision, all these different sensory systems give us inspiration on how to do things differently as we design robotics and AI, all the myriad of things that we're working on to make medicine better, life better for the humans of this earth. This insect here is really interesting. Isn't that a beauty? That's the harlequin beetle. Look at the front legs. So that's a male and a female. The legs would not be that large. They'd be normal size like the middle and hind legs. I mean, I love insects, but I feel like seeing something like that on the beach or seeing something like that anywhere really, it would freak me out a little bit. But that's impressive just because the appendages are so large and-, and They're so robust. Like those front appendages look so incredibly strong. Yeah, they are. And it's all for mating, right? To be honest, they're not really useful for anything. They can't wrap around the female. It's just females will select males with the nicer front legs, right? <laughs> And it's advantageous for you to have longer legs because you're going to have more frequent mating and you're gonna have more of your genetic material into the next generation. <laughs> and it's not unusual for me to, in social circles, uh, like at the curling club and that, for me to pull out my phone and say, look it, I just took this close up image of a male dragonfly and here's the copulatory organ. Look where it is. It's not at the end of the abdomen, it's at the base. And, and of course, I get great laughter and all that because, you know, here's Marv showing insect penises to people. And I, and I almost feel compelled I have to do that because most people don't know how insects mate and it is very different. So yes, I do feel this compelling urge just to pass on this information. One thing that drew me into entomology when I first started studying it in university was the, the process of getting a collection. And it was almost like Pokemon and it brought me back to that, yeah. that childhood. It, it made me feel like a kid again, going out and capturing, oh, what did you get in your net? And oh yeah, check that off the list, check that off the list. It was like a game. So much fun and I really encourage people to go out and just start, you know, go out and start learning about the orders. Maybe you learn one, two, three. From there, it's an addiction. It really is. You now want to get that phasmatidae. You want to get that stick bug. You're wanting to build your collection so that you end up with something beautiful like this. Well, you can start, first of all, right at home in your own backyard. See what insects are out there. 
grab yourself some field guides, or if you don't you know, like books, you can also use Mr. Google, and you can start finding all sorts of resources. If you appreciate that enough, you can actually start an image collection. And even in an urban setting, you can find all the insects that you would ever want, right? You just have to go and search. Get the dirt in your fingernails, pick up that centipede. You know, there's nothing to be afraid of. Over 99% of insects are totally harmless and beneficial. I think just to start, if you have that kind of seed of intrigue, I say go for it. Like any hobby, it has to start somewhere. It just starts with a grain of passion, and then you just build on that. How about this for a very simple light trap that you can collect insects at night? And anyone can do this. All you need is a bed sheet and a light shining on it, and you can now attract flying insects. Okay. And they will land on the bed sheet, yeah. and all you do, you can take pictures of them or you can collect them. Any light will do. The brighter, the better. Okay. And if you have a UV light, add that as well. Ooh. So here I've got a bed sheet, which you can just pick up easily at Walmart or any place. And uh, it's all you need. So we'll unfurl that puppy. We're not going to see it now because there's too much light out, right? Right. But that will illuminate a big patch of light on the sheet. The best time to do it is in the heat of the summer. You do want hot, sticky nights because insects adore those nights you're going to find the sheet just covered in all sorts of great stuff. This is really cool. This is such a, an easy way. Everybody's got a white sheet. Uh, if you don't yep. have a light, you can pick one up. And it's just kind of a fun thing to do, even with like your family. Yep. If you're interested in seeing what the biodiversity looks like yeah. inside of or in the back of your, of and your you, house. You could do it camping as well. I have personally made this trap a few times myself. Yeah. And I've set up a couple other little lures. I've done like a molasses banana beer mixture to yep. try and attract a few more of those big, impressive sacrophyte yep. moths. And this is a light trap. And what you're talking about with that fermentation mm -hmm. mixture, that, that's like a trap that attracts the scent. It's the scent of fermentation. So we learned a little bit about how you at home can kind of DIY and make your own light trap. What are some other ways that you can set traps, for example, to collect different types of insects in different habitats? If you're thinking about collecting, it's actually really, really simple. I would go around and maybe take a white piece of paper, newspaper, or an umbrella, and just go underneath a tree and shake your branches, and you'll get a ton of different things falling. Um, try different types of trees and plants and you'll get different diversity there. So it's not yeah. even necessarily that you're going and you're digging up dirt and you're really having to like move a whole lot of dirt. It can be as simple as just shuffling through the leaf litter, just kind of tapping on some bushes that might be in your backyard and that white piece of paper there is so that you can see what's actually falling so that you can then collect, put them in a bottle, look at it a little bit closer, right? So tell us more about what Bug Dex is. It's like a digital field guide mixed with a pop-up book. I love that. Yeah. That's amazing. No, that's like perfect. So it's like a field guide because you can use it to identify the things you find, but it's like a pop-up book because the elements in the field guide are interactive. So if you're wanting to learn more about butterflies, for example, or beetles, or grasshoppers, or praying mantises, you have those um, specific orders kind of broken down within bug decks that people at home can go through and actually start to learn more through this app specifically. Okay, so Marvin, you've shown us your amazing insect collection. Mm -hmm. Now, can you show us how to actually pin an insect? Sure. I mean, one thing I always recommend is if you have a jar and you see something interesting that you want a closer look at or even pin, as long as you have access to a freezer at home. Because you just take the whole jar, throw it in the freezer, and it will kill and preserve that insect for as long as you want to wait. I definitely have a couple insects in yeah. my freezer. And then later, you just thaw it, slow thaw, and then you're ready to pin. Okay. But normally, I carry 70% uh, ethanol in the little scintillation vials. And then if I see something interesting, throw them in. These would probably have been in alcohol for like two years. So what specimen are you going to be I think I'm going to do us? the locust borer. Ooh. Now that's going to be a nice robust beetle. And there's a pellicid in there too. That's a beautiful wasp. Look at this baby. This is a uh, parasitic wasp of grubs in your lawn. And it's specialized. So you can see that that length of that abdomen is about the length of grass roots. So it will be at ground level and bore 
its abdomen down and lay an egg onto a grub that's eating your lawn. Isn't that amazing? That's how specialized this, this uh, predator is. So I'm gonna grab for this specimen a number two pin. And the numbers are the thickness of the pin. So this is, number two is a classic. If you have a real small specimen, you wanna use a one or a zero. In a huge honking specimen, you would use uh, three or four. And now we've got the specimen. Okay, so it's a beetle. Beetles, you don't pin straight down the middle. You wanna pin in the upper right elytra, so right about here. Right, and then you just wanna go in nice and slow and try to go as perpendicular as you can to the body. And we have contact, I can hear it busting through the cuticle. You're yeah, like, so now looks good to me. you just let it dry like that. Or if you get, if you have a show specimen, if this is one you're really proud of, what I would do is I would cut a piece of paper, but I usually, a, a harder stock paper is better. And then what I do is put it underneath, shove it right up there. As you can see, now all the legs are a little bit more accessible. Pull the leg out and put a pin. There we go. Right, so there's the front pair. Yeah. Right, and then you would do that with the middle legs and then the hind legs, and then just let it dry for a couple days. And then you can remove all these pins, just leave the main pin in. And people might worry about there being a smell or something with them, but they really have no scent. No, no, there's, no, there's, there's nothing. We learned so much in this episode about insects, more than I thought was ever possible thanks to Dave and Marv. I really hope that it inspired you at home to get involved in the world of entomology. I want to give a huge thanks to our sponsors, Bug Dex and the Canadian Museum of Nature, and to you, the viewers at home, for sticking around. We'll see you in the next episode.